to do, a mar to do market realistic housing products on that site and make money. Uh, and then of course you want design guidelines for the housing, once again that shows how to mass it, how to do, all, how to do the rear, how all that's going to lay out, right? what the homes will look like, this is just a different community and that sort of thing. Uh, okay, uh, let's see, this is going to go till I think 8.30 and I want to get to some street improvements so I'm going to run through, oh, I want to show you this. We have found that not only, not only do you have to have a, a plan that is supported by the community and, 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 and that you work through in workshops to figure out what will the market allow us to do, how can we work with the market and how can we resegment our strip and have that, have that enforced by the community zoning ordinance on the, on the private side of the right-of-way line, it's equally important that this is equally supported by a capital improvement strategy where now rather than doing, in this case, let's say seven miles of one streetscape, we now have to do things in the right-of-way that create a mouth-watering frontage for the types of investment that we want to attract in, which means every segment has to be improved differently. So for example, the residential segment, right, Nobody's, this is the current cross section of the road. No one's going to want to put residential along there. So we have the community comes in and builds, gets rid of the left turns, right, into any, any old, uh, if, if you're building a retail segment, if anybody here is a retailer, you know that you typically want to allow left turns into uh, existing curb cuts. So customers don't have to make U-turns and that sort of thing. When you're transitioning an area to an area dominated by residential, all that changes. You don't allow willy-nilly left turns. There are no suicide lanes. Instead, you want to create green leaf, dappled shade and shadow, big green leafy environments, medians and, 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 and side areas with decorative lights and, and trees. You want to have the, the homes built within 35 feet or so of, of the property line. So the proportion of the space is changed and it's changed in a way that is mouth-watering for residential developers. Workplace areas. In this particular case, there you see the workplace area. Uh, zoning for the workplace area, again, very different, not allowing retail entitlements, but except we are now finding that rather than building workplace surrounded by a lot of open space that the city will usually insist on, we are finding now that the markets are changing and, and that, never mind the word new economy, we are now finding that in order to be competitive, Workplace, the whole workplace market has shifted to a certain degree rather than employees chasing uh, employment, even though we are in a very bad job market right now, there is a very distinct trend for employers to be competing with each other for pools of employees. The types of pools of employees that employers and, and, uh, and workplace developers particularly in the office markets are, are, are competing for, we are now beginning to see that, the, that they, the more competitive workplace developments are areas that now have things that we call vital centers. There are places where idea exchange can happen, where, where informal meetings can happen, uh, and that sort of thing. As you can see in there, chance encounters in hallways, restaurants, neighborhoods, conferences lead to new partnerships and solutions to tough problems. As the major players in the, in the uh, workplace market get on board here, we are finding that the business park is becoming an anachronism and it is very important to create an area that is set aside where the ground floor retail entitlements are concentrated and you get lunch places, public realm, ground floor, window door, window door, internet cafes, good amenities outside, the ability to sit in sun or in shade and all of that sort of thing in the center of our workplace areas. So having that front the retail corridor and advertise the type of, of workplace area that uh, you have in that area not only shows that this is an area transform, transforming itself out of the retail only corridor, but you also have an area where you are advertising your vital center. In these areas, we allow the office buildings to be built very close to the back of sidewalk, uh, very different standards and guidelines for workplace in this area than we allow in the retail areas or that we have in the areas where the presumptive use is housing. Vital center, example of a vital center in one of the projects that we master plan. You can see the difference. This is dying, it is being replaced by this. It's good news for everybody. It costs the developer less land, it creates more critical mass, it creates a more safe area, and it creates areas where we can have the kind of idea exchange and that sort of thing that really fuels the service economy today. That goes again with architectural standards and guidelines. Now, for my last sort of topic on this, I want to say once the community 
has its vision for how the corridor will be restructured in order to take advantage of the changes in the structure of demand for today. And once the zoning code reflects those changes, the community is then ready to allow investment to flow in in a much better way. But just because we're ready, the zoning doesn't, do, doesn't, doesn't bring investment in. In other words, you can't legislate that investment must come. So the zoning simply says, if anybody wants to invest, now we're ready. And, that, and if, if we really get the investors in, we know that it's going to be built in such a way that will make our town more competitive or revitalize our third street or whatever it is. Now comes the question, which is the one that we're asked to deal with the most, which is, well, how do we instigate this restructuring and stimulate investment? So we find that any project that one does where you're not getting investment, you need to be able to write some kind of an action plan that doesn't cover a whole page. It needs to be, what are, the, what are the five or six or seven or eight things that we're going to do next? And that always varies from city to city. But it should be very focused and very short. Let's take an example. This is one of the biggest problem corridors that we have ever dealt with in my office. This happens to be in the state of California, not near where our office is in San Francisco. It's way down in the Southland. For those of you who know Palm Springs, Palm Desert, Rancho Mirage, it's the Coachella Valley. That's where this is. This is the road which is Palm Canyon Drive that many of you may know from the resorts and golfing places down there that connects all those cities. Route 111. Palm Desert, Palm Springs, Cathedral City, uh, Rancho Mirage, all of them. Indi Indian Wells are all connected by this very wide road. And so obviously that road started narrow when Clark Gable and Bob Hope and those guys first started going out there and making this place famous. But that same road obviously had to get wider and wider and wider. So the downtowns were, were put on that road and they were downtown-like. I mean, the stores sort of faced out and there was curbside parking and a, and a, uh, and a, surf and a uh, sidewalk there. But what happened was, of course, since this is the road that connects all of those cities, it needed to get wider and wider and wider and wider and wider until finally the curbside parking was taken off and the, and the sidewalks were narrowed down to seven feet from the face of building. Enter Freeman Tongue and Bottomley. We get there and we ask everybody, well, what do you think went wrong? And they say, you know, those merchants down there on Route 111, they just aren't any good at doing their business, right? Now, <laughs> we hear this all the time. You, who ruined? Who ruined this commercial area, right? I'm not saying the road didn't need to widen. Of course it needed to widen. It's the commercial artery of the whole Coachella Valley. So they widened it. But as it happens, the department in this city that is responsible for laying out and designing this road is a different department. That's usually called public works, right? And this department in this really weird city is called the planning department, and they're responsible for this side of the right-of-way line. Now, you're not going to believe this, but the public works department and the planning department don't actually collaborate when they do stuff. <laughs> in fact, even though they really say they, they, they like each other as friends and go to each other's Christmas parties and whatnot, they're not really, they're a little bit suspicious of each other's professional knowledge. <laughs> The planners will blame the public works guys for ruining all the cities in America. And the, the public works engineers will say, you know, all that planning stuff, I mean, it really doesn't amount to very much. So what we have is the public works department was given the, given the direction by the city council, which was the correct direction to widen the road, right? And they didn't talk to the planning department, of course. I mean, that's that city. I know that doesn't work that way here. So, so what we ended up was no parking, right? And big wide road and cars going 40 miles an hour by. And, what do you know? Nobody wanted to stand on this <laughs> sidewalk. Weird people. And people going so close to that they couldn't read the signs. Probably bad vision, right? <laughs> so this is what happened, right? Complete destruction of the retail environment. Obviously, the community destroyed the retail environment. Maybe they needed to, but the weird thing is we have come so far away from the arts of actually making great cities and towns that the community didn't know. They had no idea that they had anything to do with the distress of those business. They, they, they're bad at their business. So this whole area was blighted. And I mean blighted, right? There it is all falling apart and everybody panicking. And this is the historic center of this city. So this is sort of a cartoon example of the, the disinvestment growing further and further out. You know, disinvestment never stays still. That loss of value, you know, first you have a store falling apart, and then the house next to the store goes rental, not nothing against renters, right? It's just that the renter will usually pay, spend less money for 
taking care of the house. What is it Lawrence Summers said to President of Harvard, in the whole history of the world, no one's ever washed a rented car. Same, same thing happens with... <laughs> so then you have loss of home ownership, creeping disinvestment, right? And you have this huge great cloud of disinvestment creeping further and further in, alarming the city council. So, so what happened physically? Well, there was a downtown, and those uses came here, but the sidewalk environment got really bad, and this, the signs became invisible. And so when, where money was available, what happened? Well, this kind of thing changed into this kind of thing, where the store would be set back from the road to protect itself from the brutality of that environment, right, the arterial, and it would open its door out to the parking lot, in this case here, right? So good news, right? New investment, since there's money in the area, was coming in and taking out the blight and replacing it with this. However, this, the community said, you know, we don't want that. We want this. That's our historic downtown. We want people to walk and love it on there. We want activity. We want it to be the center of our town, right? So, oh, that's a different story. So the, the, the theory was, again, to change this, right, and reflect the trends in current retailing, to cluster the retail in a cluster that would be right on the corridor but also be their downtown, right? And then to transition these flanks, allowing the neighborhood to come up to the edges. So, to do that, essentially, in that location. So, of course, we laid out where the downtown would be and we created different segments and different zoning requirements in each of the segments like I showed you earlier. We master planned the downtown itself, right? And then we figured out what the design context was so that we would be building on the best of what was already there. And we also threw in a little Lawrence of Arabia because that's what was going on in the desert at the time. And we developed a language of how to make pretty much anything down there. So now we have a master plan, we have our zoning, and we've got our language of design. And this is the downtown that the city has built and in fact dreamed about. And this is the drawing that we came up with, which is a drawing of their, the center that would be right out on the front, front road here. Now, we did uh, uh, prototypes to show how to do lodging and office and housing and everything and how to lay out the whole thing and how it would all work, right? And so we were, as we say, ready, right? We were ready. However, this environment still looked horrible, right? So we figured if, some, if you were to take somebody driving down the street here, they were still going to see all those, they were going to see the identity you saw in those first ugly slides, slides I showed you. So we realized that w if this was going to happen, we ought to change this. In other words, no one would invest in that blighted area because they didn't believe. So we said, okay, the city's got to get in there and be the first investor. It's got to go in there and change the actual right-of-way to be the kind of place that people want to build the downtown frontage and the mixed housing office and, and lodging frontage flanking the downtown and replace everything that's out there, right? And so first, so we developed a design realizing that you can't do a downtown on both sides of a six-lane corridor, we realized downtown had to be on one side. So that meant that the, uh, the, the, the whole corridor, and this is very typical, needs to look unified and have a very powerful identity in the middle, right, to flatter the identity of the city as well as attract investors, but it actually had to do different things in different areas. Here we had to accommodate housing, lodging, or commercial uses facing the boulevard. This had to be the downtown. So, and of course the evolution into a transit system. So in actual fact, on the downtown side, we designed what we call the adaptable boulevard. In this case, we put a parallel route in, like a little main street route with slow moving traffic and angle parking, protected from five lanes of fast moving traffic. And on this side, where we want to attract in the housing, the office, and the lodging, we put in a double bike lane, a big drop off area with parallel parking, and the sidewalk, and a very lushly planted area. But in the middle, everything looks unified. And so, looking at the downtown area first, this is what we had to work with. This is what we envisioned it. You see the difference there? Here you feel like you're exposed to the traffic. Here you feel buffered. You are buffered by angled parking, trees in the angled parking, a slow moving Main Street environment, and another row of trees before you hit the fast moving traffic. On the other side, looking back at the downtown, look at this, look at that sidewalk. You gotta have crampons to get up into that restaurant. <laughs> They, 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 the business people have no idea what they're doing, right? At any rate, uh, looking back at the downtown, there you see the housing, common entrance to the housing, sidewalk, planning strip,
drop off, parallel parking, double bike lane, another row of trees, and then the fast moving traffic. Looking back at what we envisioned as a big bell tower to the, be, be the entrance of the downtown. Remember, you're dealing with the scale of a six to eight lane road. Large gestures work. It's not a downtown where fine grain gestures work, although you need the fine grain as well. And there it is built. What we did is we advanced the road. We literally went out there and put in everything, including full, we uplit the palms, we, ho we crane lifted in mature palms, right? We put in all the angle parking, put everything in, the transit and everything, prior to having the investors. Then, there, there it is just, just before it was finished. Okay, there's the, the idea of having a, a big landmark in there. We said, let's put the landmark in too. City went in, we designed the landmark, put in the landmark. So there's the entrance to the downtown with no investment in, right? No investment at all. And finally, the city wanted their city hall downtown, so we did a competition did a design for a town green that it would in front. There's a city hall fronting the town green. But the fun part was, we then put a redevelopment agency in and knocked everything down. So rather than seeing blight, all you could see were development sites. Development sites with phone numbers, our phone numbers. <laughs> the city hall, which pulls investment back from the strip, and the totally rebuilt segment of Palm Canyon Drive, which became overnight the most, by far the most beautiful segment of Palm Canyon Drive. So there you see one way of having the community be the first investor, create, prime the pump for investment, create the frontage that is mouth-watering for the types of investment you want to bring in, where you can create different kinds of frontages and still unify the street. What if you have less room? You still have a big wide road. There's another one we did, much less room, uh, sprawl sort of coming in to eat up the historic downtown where the, where, the, where, the, where the corridor comes through. Very large revitalization strategy and infill. But this was the, the section where the strip passes through the, the old downtown. And there you see a very wide, woo, very wide road. We changed the proportions of the street by doing this. We added, we we added crosswalks, very important on the strip, so that every 300 foot you could get across rather than having to walk 2,000 feet to be able to get to the other side of a shopping district. Made the crossings nice. Looked at the design context again, which was dominated by the racetrack, very famous racetrack in this particular city. D developed uh, furniture that drew on the basis of the racetrack and the historic architectural themes of this particular city. Ch did a design to change this into this. Now, what I want to call your attention to is, because the right-of-way was so constrained, and because this is not a convenience retail-oriented area where you, you really live and die with quick in, quick out parking, we're able to expand the sidewalk and make a sidewalk comfortable for people to use the whole sidewalk, even though a whole lot of traffic's going down the five lanes in the middle, by building a decorative fence at its edge. Right? So this is sort of the opposite of the one I just showed you in the Coachella Valley, which had angled parking. This is for a comparison at specialty retail area where you have wide sidewalks protected and again a very strong identity that's flattering rather than destructive of the city's identity. Another thing you can do with capital improvements is you can show people you know our city starts here and this one sort of surprised us. This was the first commercial corridor we ever remaster plan and they later brought us back to do the do this improvement so right at this point where this particular city starts we built a real big monument saying this is where our city starts. And the strangest thing, which we didn't, we can't really take credit for because we did, there, there you see the architectural themes that it came from. There it is lit up at night. Uh, by the way, this is where the, we didn't do relinquishment like you did here and everyone said the state will never let you do that. It's illegal. Well, there it is. The state let us do it, but we had a bribe. And it, not really. Come on tape. We didn't bribe. We were nice to them. They had never seen anybody nice to them. So, <laughs> really, cities are used to fighting with the, with the state uh, transportation department, so we decided to take a different tack. Worked very well. They violated their own rules and put this in, and it's worked really well from the, from, from the minute it started going in. Landmarks, you know, in the, in the whole sort of toolbox of city making, we have forgotten probably boulevards and landmarks more than anything else. It's almost like the words feel old-fashioned these days. So we're turning quarters into grand boulevards again, and we're using tools like landmarks. When this thing wasn't even half done, this article came out about Renaissance. And then, what do you know? All the new investment, where does it go? Everybody wants to be near the Gateway Arch. So everything starts going in by the Gateway Arch. So landmarks would be very powerful things, I guess is the lesson that uh, we all learned there. Uh, another thing you can do is if your downtown or a special district is running parallel, you can call attention to the entrance to that district 
by showing it's not just part of the strip. This is the city of Lodi, where a wonderful downtown that we were asked to revitalize, and, and, and we did successfully revitalize, was hidden because you were going down the commercial corridor and it didn't look like this was an entrance to downtown. There, there was Pizza Hut delivery and Lions, and you just kept going. So what we did was we sort of did something outrageous, again, on the theme of landmarks, and took the architecture of the downtown and pulled it out and designed a gateway and built the gateway right out on the strip so that people would think, what is down there? You know? So land, landmarks can entice people. And this has been very, very successful. Again, to our, you know, when, when you're a so-called expert in this field, you always are sure everything's going to work. But I'll tell you, the, the dirty secret is, when it works, it's a shock. <laughs> It feels like magic. I mean, you, you know why it worked and you know why it's going to work, but when people actually make their own independent decisions and pile in and hundreds of them, it, it's just, it's a shock. It, it just feels like a miracle. I got to admit, after 20 years, it still feels like a miracle. All right. I think I'll end on that. So I hope I have given you the sense that commercial corridors are a new, uh, poorly understood phenomenon with a tremendous amount of potential. I hope I have given you the sense that of all of the different challenges that our cities face, more than, any, more than any of the others, the commercial corridor requires that the cities, the public sector, rediscovers its role in the development process of setting the pattern. I hope I've given you the sense that you can creatively use a open public workshop sessions to create market realistic visions and that they do need to be market realistic and based on real economic feasibility. You can use your zoning to, to make sure that development incrementally or quickly adds up to a highly competitive uh, commercial corridor, a mixed-use corridor that reflects the most successful trends in the marketplace of today. And I, would, I have given you the sense that if you like, you can instigate or stimulate or prime the pump for that investment by working on both sides of the right-of-way line. Thank you very much for listening. I would be happy, it's okay, right, to take some questions if anybody has any. Uh, I, am, I have been asked to repeat the question so that it gets onto the tape. Yes, sir. Um, actually, a couple of questions, but I'll start with one. I, I saw some of your uh, design guidelines early on the commercial zoning, and you had minimum FARs, I think I saw. They seem to be one to, to between 1.0 and 2.0. At what point do you find that a minimum FAR requires structured parking? Well, we find that structured parking is actually a function of land value. In fact, we don't find it, it is. So, so it is very important in taking a look at any corridor to find out what the land values are. Land values need to get to about $32 a square foot. We, Kirk, what do you think? 32, 34, somewhere in there until it makes any economic sense to switch from a surface lot. Is that, yeah. is that, is that a good rule of thumb for you? So, well, there you go. So, so, so land va if land value is now around 3rd Street or I don't know, say 10, 12 bucks a, s a square foot, it doesn't make any sense for the developer to go in there and structure. However, um, I don't know what slide you were looking at when you mentioned those FARs, but the fact is the single biggest problem on the private side of the right-of-way line in terms of zoning is that the strips are always zoned as one thing. They are zoned as all commercial and all one set of intensities. When you look back at what the strip, the real maximum performance of your commercial corridors can be, you will find that you don't just segment them for different focus, different focused uh, uh, combinations of use. Certain areas should be much greater intensity than other areas, and you need to program those. So. If you have an area, for example, that's in walking distance of the downtown and already has a lot of workplace in it, that's a likely area where you want to allow greater heights and greater intensities. Because in any given town, not just corridor, it's very important for the community to say, what are the areas we want to be the most active that feel like the heart of town or the hearts of our neighborhoods? Those are the areas to, to, to spend extra heights and extra, zone, and extra FAR on in order to allow those areas to get up. In fact, in some areas, we put minimum FARs and minimum heights on the areas where the community says, no, that area's got to be lively. That's got to feel like the heart of things over there. You will find that because the commercial strips are so central to the communities, many of them cross areas that are already 
across the edge of areas that are already really known to be, desired to be, the hearts of the community. So that's an early sense that, gee, maybe that ought to be an area where we have greater FAR. So no, there is no magic 1.0 or 2.0 number by any means. And even in areas where the land values are not there, there's nothing wrong with allowing some greater intensity. Although if you allow it ridiculously great, you may have a property owner that sits, sits there and, and prays that, that someone will come in with that intensity and won't let go of their property. So there is that danger. Oh, minimums. Yeah. Okay. Well, when it comes to minimums, we only put them in the areas that the community envisions as high, very, very lively. Otherwise, we control uh, intensity by putting a maximum number of parking spaces in for the surface lots. We find that to be a more effective and straightforward control. Any other questions? Yes, in the back. Uh, yeah, can you elaborate a little more? Any ideas you have on how to redesign major intersections of our materials where today they may be unattractive, uh, trash sources of places where you have traffic jams, and changing them into uh, places where the traffic might flow better, but at the same time also creating landmarks, making them more attractive? Uh, so the question is, uh, what about ideas for the redesign of major intersections uh, to enhance traffic flow and perhaps do other things? Yeah, is that, exactly. that a in band the intersection of third and Greenwood. Well, it really depends for, for, for us. I don't, know, I don't know where to begin on this one. I want to say this, that one of the big mistakes that the urban design profession has uncovered, that the making of the modern city that came with the making of the modern city that was never there before is that today first we put in roads then we put in the private development and then if there's any space left over we'll put in some public space and public buildings the best cities and towns worldwide as it turns out were built the other way first the public places were located then the private development and then the roads served that pattern of development so we find that it is very important to caution ourselves that Usually we are used to beginning our design work with traffic design, which is an enormous mistake, with road design, with block design. Having said that, um, we would recommend that in order to answer any street design problem, whether it's at an intersection or not, our first question is always, well, what pattern of land use and development should that road be serving? So if the intersection has retail at one quadrant or two quadrants or whatever, usually one is better than two or three or four because the intersections are very wide, you would do something different than if it was other uses. Um, in terms of helping traffic to flow more freely, um, there are lots of devices that, that we're now learning about from uh, roundabouts because if you have two roads with somewhat closely balanced um, capacities, you can take out all of the traffic lights and you can have free flowing around traffic roundabouts and that can be very helpful. Another thing that we do is in order to enhance crossing, if it's in a retail area, we put in curbside parking and then extend the sidewalk out to the, to the location of the back of each parking space, which greatly reduces the actual crossing distance. Um, in terms of landmarks, again, uh, the sky's the limit. If you do roundabouts, you can put them in the middle. Uh, you can also, we, we tend to encourage folks to think about using buildings and landmarks. Any intersection is a wonderful opportunity to sort of add a little bit more mass to the buildings that come out to the corner, bring activity out to the corner, and create a sense of a little bit more intimacy in terms of the scale of the overall space. We find that people do not like the big intersections because it's a tremendous amount of unde un undefined space, and you can't really define space with a bell tower, a clock tower, or an obelisk. You really need buildings to do that. So again, I think begin with the pattern of land use and development. Be suspicious about intersection patterns of land use and development